Very grateful to have Simon with us today. Simon has been part of Consensus and he has been ac actively building and designing all these very interesting and novel crypto economic systems, especially looking at bonding curves. He was one of the first person to come up with the idea of bonding curves and create the name bonding curves and looking at a lot of other applications to understand how complex economics can be added into the crypto space moving forward. So we're very lucky to have him today. And in today's episode, we're talking about the various types of economic concepts like bonding curves, non-fungible tokens, as well as Harbinger Texas. Hi, Simon. So thanks for joining us in this little podcast series. And let's get started with talking about your artwork called The Art Is Always On Sale. It's an NFT, so a non-fungible token, and the model uses Harbinger Texas. And recently you made a version 2 update on it. So can you share a little bit more about what Harbinger Texas are? And can you tell us more about what The Art Is Always On Sale is and what the changes are in version 2? Hmm. Sure. Um, nice to be here. Uh, I've watched some of your videos and it's been it's been it's really great that you're doing this. Um, so Harbinger Texas, it, it's not that a new idea. Uh, I think it was first proposed, I think in the 60s and 70s already um, by the economist Arnold Harberger. Um, it recently gained popularity again through the book by Glenn Weil and Eric Posner called Radical Markets. And what Harberger Texas are is it's an approach to property rights that tries to find a middle ground between like like pure private property and sort of public property. So somewhere in the middle, we want to have a, um, a middle ground that sort of makes assets more readily uh, available to be utilized, but it's not, it's not possible to exclude them from the market. And that has certain benefits in certain applications. Um, in, in, in public society, but also in the blockchain space. And that's where, you know, when I read about Harbinger Taxes, it, that, that's the thing that was really interesting for me to think about in the context of blockchain technology, just because we can experiment with these things. So Harbinger Taxes, uh, another way to phrase it uh, that I like to describe it is that it's an asset that's always on sale, right? So when you own an asset, um, you always have to specify a sale price. Like you, that means you can't exclude it from the market. It, it is always up for sale. And it's your responsibility to always post some kind of sale price because anyone can then buy it at that sale price. But there is some, there's an additional feature that makes it such that you can't price it at an exclusionary price. Like you can't buy um, something and then price it at like $10 trillion. Because the reason is, is there's what's called a tax rate. And in this case, it's the Harbinger tax rate. That is a fee you pay on a continuous basis for keeping the asset. So, um, and that sort of tax rate then goes to whatever is necessary for, or like whatever is decided is necessary for that specific asset. The original designs in, in sort of public, the, the public sphere was that like there are underutilized assets in our economy that is excluded from use, right? Let's say like a factory where the factory owner has no interest in maintaining it or it, it's left abandoned. That can then be scooped up by someone and more productively utilized. And then this tax revenue goes towards like funding public goods in, in a society. Um, so, that idea I, I thought was very interesting. I, I still think like this, there's, there's a lot of new ways in which we think about how property rights work with such a model. Like a lot of people seem to push back against it due to things like, I don't want to live in an apartment or a home or a building that can be suddenly bought away from me. I don't want to spend my time like constantly updating my price and worrying that tomorrow my, my home might not be mine anymore. But I think in the context of like blockchain technology, there's a lot more ways to experiment with it that is opt-in. Like we can opt into the system to see if they are more beneficial. And when I read that, I was like, the first thing that came to mind to me was like, this could be a model to fund creators um, with the tax revenue going towards the creators. And because we saw like this boom in crypto art and NFTs and collectibles, this seemed a way to, to like, 
to effectively price these assets in a different way, right? Because you always have to specify sale price. Um, and it allowed sort of a new revenue model for creators or platform developers or individual artists to earn from creating things. And that's when I decided to just give it a go. And I created um, the first artwork that is always on sale. And it, it ran for about a year and it, it, it's, it's the tax rate I decided was 5%, but I guess we can speak later about the specific tax rates, but it ran for a year essentially, and it was always on sale. Um, it's been valued at like 240 ether for like more than a year now, year and a half, or I think already. Um, at, that usually hovers around, I don't know what the price is recently, but like let's say between 50,000 to 70,000 dollars. And 5% of that a year goes towards me as the artist. Um, and initially there was some high turnover, but since been held by one uh, owner since then. Um, another team uh, took this idea for conservation. So they made these collectibles such that um, if you own this animal, this collectible animal, it, it, the, the revenue goes towards um, conservation. And the, the way I classified this kind of new market is like um, patronage as an asset class. Um, and they took that model, they ran with it, They're, they've been doing really great work. And what then happened is like one of the developers um, found some potential issues in the code that I wrote for the artwork source and sale. And then I took this opportunity to just, you know, go back to the drawing board, like recode some of it. Luckily it wasn't like, uh, bugs that would cause the current owner to lose funds, but it was it was it was bugs that was enough that it could hamper the future success of the project. So I decided let me just launch a version two of the artwork is always on sale, but also decided to to take this opportunity to introduce a new tax rate. So version one had a tax rate of five percent per year, and version two has a tax rate of a hundred percent a year. So it's quite different. And that also changes the relationship between the price and the revenue. So with the, the fact that there were bugs in the code of the, the, the first artwork that was always on sale, it gave me an opportunity to also to fix that, but also then go back to the drawing board and look at the economics again. I think one of the things that I, that I wanted to see more of in the first experiment was that it changed hands more often. And one way to do that is to increase the tax rate. So the first one's tax rate was 5% and the version two's tax rate is 100%. And this changes the relationship between the price and the revenue that's received by the artist. So, you know, if it's, if it's like 100 ether, price at 100 ether, the second artwork will have more money flowing to the artist because you pay 100% of 100 ether a year. Um, but this also depresses the price because you, you have to pay more to set a higher price, uh, which means that in general, as based on the theory at least, the art book should turn over more often a year. And in the academic literature on the Harberger tax, um, the way they specified is that the tax rate essentially amounts to the likelihood of the asset like changing hands in a year. So if it's 5% tax rate per year, then you could, then you could infer basically that there's a 5% chance that it would change hands this year. Um, in in a sort of in a normal economy, but this this isn't entirely a normal economy. Um, but that was just like sort of heuristic, like to think about. It's just like up the tax rate, you increase the turnover, you decrease the price. Then we'll see what happens. So uh, currently, artwork version two it has been on sales since I think I launched it in June or July, and it's been working so far. The price is lower, uh, but we'll see whether it as successful as the first version of the artwork um and yeah that's uh i think that's answered all the questions let me know if there's more yeah so what i'm trying what i've been figuring out to understand is that how does an increase in taxation increase the likelihood of people changing hands is it because there is an increase in taxation so if i hold it for a longer period of time i have to pay 100 percent taxes on items then it makes me want to get rid of the item faster. So it incentivizes the change in hands or is there a different economic incentive mechanism embedded in this? Mm. I think that that is one 
um, part of it. But I think the more the most important part is is that the because the tax rate is higher, the the uh, depending on what price you, you you choose as the owner, like you will pay more, right? Which means that the, um, if someone else wants to buy the asset, the price, the the sort of entry fee, the the, the ability to take over ownership of the asset is lower, right? Um, so it's it's like it's like if if the tax if if you think on, on the extremes, like if the tax rate is say zero point zero zero one percent, someone can make the price like a hundred million like hundred million dollars, right? But now, in order to own the artwork, it doesn't it doesn't matter if you if you can pay like three or four weeks or a year's worth of, of fees. You still need to do that initial investment of like a hundred million dollars. So on the other extreme, if the if the tax rate is like ten thousand percent, right? It means that like the 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 initial investment that you need to make to take over ownership will be much 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 lower, just because the cost increases. So in general, a higher tax rate increases turnover because it would generally lead to lower prices of the asset. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean that the the revenue I receive as an artist uh, changes. It could be it could be the same amount, and I think that's still sort of the the outstanding questions in terms of these economics that needs to be answered. Like what what kind of tax rate for NFT crypto art as an asset? Would lead to the, the the artist earning the most, right? Because art 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 is also strange because like there's a, there's a relationship to price and how people value it. Like if something is valued a lot, then it attracts eyeballs and gets more people interested in it. So there's there's interesting relationships that that still need to sort of be experiment experimented with, and that's why I went from like five percent to like let's go with hundred percent and see what happens. But there's another reason why I I chose hundred percent. Uh, it just made it easier for a user or a potential owner to determine what they need to pay to keep it, right? So if the price is five Ether, you know that you will need five Ether for this year to keep it for a year. So it's just mental accounting that I didn't have to do as a developer to show what, what's needed to keep it for a certain period. So the prices are determined by the users, basically. And the market yes. will determine how much is it because it's a self-assessed price according to Harbinger, Texas. What if yes, we sir. can, what if we can embed um, automatic pricing into this mechanism so that it gives a level of price floor to the asset, and then any additional prices will be determined by market through speculation because they think that you mm -hmm. as an artist has super much value, and I want to invest in you. But still, I don't want to decrease the value by underpricing your asset. So there is an, mm. let's say through token bonding curves, and there's an automatic market maker that determines the price flaw. Could that work? And mm. how would that mm. look like? Yes, that is, um, that is like a, a, a different way to also bring about sort of uh, price discovery for these kind of assets and, and also like play around with property rights of these kind of assets. And a token bonding curve is a, is, is a perfect use case for this. I, I wrote up on examples for this in, in NFT crypto art, but also for um, exploring this in like experimental land rights, say parcels in crypto voxels or land in the central land um, where each land parcel is an NFT. Um, the, the, way to, the, the way it works is with, without thinking about Harbinger tax for now is that um, as an artist, I can choose to sell uh, one of my artworks um, and it's all part of a specific collection that is just Simon's art. There, there needs to be some defined category or like collection that all share some, some, uh, does some shared liquidity. Um, and in this case, the artist can decide, but it could be Simon's artwork or it can be something like CryptoKitties where all the CryptoKitties is, part, is a part of the category. So. Um, if one is familiar with the token bonding curve, um, the way it works is you buy the artwork um, at a specific price along the, the price curve. And that is, all, that is set by the amount of artworks that are already in circulation. And um, that ether, let's say ether, gets put in this reserve pool as is, as is usually the case with the token bonding curve, except what you get out is not an ERC-20 fungible token, 
you get one NFT that is a specific artwork, right? Um, and in the same manner as the bonding curve works is like whoever owns all of these artworks and correctly as you described, then has a floor price, which means that anyone that currently holds an artwork can choose to sort of decommission or destroy the artwork by selling it into the bonding curve and taking out this collateral that was used to mint these artworks. Um, so you're, cor you're correct in that it creates a floor price, um, but it doesn't mean that the artworks could be valued much higher than whatever the floor is. So based on like how large this collection is, um, there would always be an there could always be an incentive for people to say, um, I don't want to hold this artwork anymore. I want to get back this underlying collateral that backs this artwork. So it could be used in different contexts. It might not be um, good options for if you if you're an artist that say like creates specific artworks like that and then choose to sell it. Um, I think it it's more interesting in the case where it's possible to to generate artworks and like generative artworks or in a case of a virtual economy new pieces of land because what can happen is is that there's essentially a sort of infinite space of possibilities of what could be created and this is a way to ask the market to decide how much should be in circulation so um, this is always a question that collectible creators ask is how many editions should there, should there be or like how many versions of an artwork should there be right or how many should be in a category like we know that if you mint 100 million crypto kitties it's not going to be worth much but if you mint one crypto kitty you're not exploring the maximum capacity of this economy so that's a way to sort of automatically shrink and grow the economic the economy of collectibles in a specific category. So if I, I was looking at one of your articles talking about the incentive structure between oversupplying and undersupplying, and at the end it looks like a normal normal curve function. So you have mm -hmm. an like a, a bell-shaped curve. So the first half of it shows that there is an incentive because there's a marginal marginal benefit to the entire ecosystem by minting more. So there is a little upward sloping graph. And then once it mm -hmm. hits a medium point or hits an average, that's where the utility stops producing and then it, it goes down and it reduces. Mm. So is it so if there is a way to analyze the utility that each token brings, how would that show in a token bonding curve? Or how, how can we mm. translate that in a, into a token bonding curve? Yeah, that's 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 difficult. Um, that's difficult to decide because you know that that sort of relationship between like marginal benefit of an additional token. You you obviously then still need to decide like like in order to capture the maximum capacity of this economy, like you need to before the economy is launched decide how this curve is going to look. You know, so if it's like an S-shaped bonding curve, then you need to decide like or you need to be sure that if you if it gets to like a logarithmic plateau that you've captured most of the economy that you think is, is relevant. So, so it's, it's, it's hard to decide that. And that's why like, unless there's more research on this or unless there's sort of more design thinking, my usual recommendation is just, you know, don't get too fancy too early. Um, you know, just stick, stick with a curve that, that doesn't do strange things in its like latter part of its life cycle. So just like a linear bonding curve to start with that and then see the real, how this relationship plays out. Um, if it's an exponential one, you might like run into a, you might, you might cap the potential economy too soon. Um, if it's logarithmic, then you might not capture enough of the economy. Um, I think I have the relationship correct, but I might be wrong. But, but yeah, so it's, it's essentially like, I would, I, would, I would say it's not, it's not clear what the right answer is to choose how to get that optimal bell curve of marginal utility. Um, maybe we need something like CAD-CAD to model the potential outcomes and just, and just see. And until that's the case, I would I usually recommend people just to keep it simple. Like, don't get fancy with the bonding curve. Yeah. 
The difference between NFTs and or like fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens is that with non-fungible to with fungible tokens, it's more ubiquitous and everyone you can participate a bit more governance into defining how the token bonding curve could look like and you can change the different aspects of governance. Not change the shape of the curve, but you can have a little bit more things in, involved. But with non-fungible mm -hmm. tokens, governance doesn't really play such a big role. Or how do you envision governance to come in in non-fungible tokens? Mm -hmm. Um, I, th I, th I think there are different ways. Um, I think, I think one of them is just to, just to treat governance through, if it's like NFTs based on the fact that one NFT is one vote. So it, it wouldn't necessarily be that different from an ERC 20. It's just like an NFT is like a membership. Like it's, it acts more like a cooperative. Maybe it's like, like if you hold, 10 artworks, you get 10 votes. So it wouldn't necessarily be that different. Uh, another way is to, is to consider um, just, just based on, 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 on like um, ownership time or like ownership weight. Like if you, if, you if you hold an artwork for a specific time and there is this sort of always this incentive to sell it, like either with hard work or taxes, there's, there's always an incentive that someone can take it away or in, in token bonding curve, where there's a, there's a floor price, could be a floor price for NFTs, um, there's always incentive to go like, I could sell this and take back a more liquid collateral at any point in time. So there's always an opportunity cost in both these examples to keep the asset. So that could also be a signal to say like, I'm interested in this economy because look, I am actually um, undergoing opportunity cost. My voice matters more. Yeah. In a lot of cases, we use Harbinger taxes and we or token bonding curve or the both of them in non-fungible tokens as a way to be pricing pricing these assets because in a virtual world it's quite difficult to price them. And so, mm. in your in your articles, you talk about novel uh, no, novel patronage systems. So you're giving you're just rewarding the thanking the creators for creating this. And you want to be rewarding them in that way. And mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to be using NFTs and all these continuous patronage or continuous collectible as a way of sustainable funding? Not a way to say thank you, mm -hmm. but as a way to be funding the ecosystem and to give ownership back to the people as part of the, the system citizens in a way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, I think there's this, like a lot of interlocking incentives here, um, both of which is like sustainable funding towards the artist, like a more efficient economy that, that doesn't like over inflate its supply or like or like has like too little supply and then the third third one is also a way to fund an ecosystem or specific artists or creators such that yes it becomes more sustainable funding um you know when you look at a platform say like super rare which is a crypto art platform they have the secondary sales where um, the, a, a, every secondary sale the artist earns some cut of the sale the thing about that kind of um, trade-off is that yes, in super rare, like if you buy the crypto art, you have it forever. You don't have to worry about it being sold. Mm -hmm. But the trade-off is that is that you would only have revenue if it's sold again. In this artwork is always on sale. You go a bit further along the axis where you say, I this is always on sale, but I always get revenue. So for the artist, um, there is a semblance where I could. I could more readily model my own cash flow, right? If I know, like, at least with some level of certainty that, you know, every month I might get like an ether coming into my like address. So I think I think it's valuable in that sense, just to have like a knowledge of like more certain cash flow. It's not certain, but it's at least more certain than a potential future sale that might not might not ever happen. Um, but ultimately, I I, I do in I think there's still so many ways in which you can play with sort of pooling these funds in different ways. Um, the wildcards team, for example, that does the hardware attacks for conservation, you know, there's, there's the, 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 the thing about the, the way hardware tax collectibles currently work on Ethereum is that you need to have a deposit, right? That deposit keeps paying every block towards the, the artist or the, or whatever beneficiary there is. The thing that could be done with that collateral is like it could be put into, throw it into DeFi, 
and everyone earns interest based on the fact that all these funds are on escrow constantly, on escrow or deposit. Um, so that could be some way to gather funds, the same way to do with the bonding curve, because, because the funds is in this collateral and it supports the floor price for all the as assets, that could also go into DeFi and earn interest. Um, and then you could decide, there's so many different ways. Maybe the, there's a, 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 like a way to siphon funds from the sale of the artworks into a DAO and say all the owners of the artworks or the, all the owners of this virtual land or, or like all the conservationists together can decide to direct funds in different ways. You can then even bring in like quadratic funding if you want to, because now there's a pool of assets and people can vote to decide where it goes. So there's so many ways in which this can interlock still that I think like I'm excited to see happen. I want to see more of this happen so we can see what works best. I was thinking of a model where the creator has its, has it, they can have a, an asset and that will be either through Habanga taxation or normal, normal buy sell co curve or normal token bonding curve. It is whatever it is, but the artist itself has, um, has its own reputation or its own individual tokens. So it, it's a token to its name. And every time it's being, mm. every time and the asset is being sold, then it takes in the creator, the person that buys it, will get number one, will get the asset, will be paying it. Part of the transaction will go back to the owner and they will also be getting some aspects of an individual's token, the creator's token. And mm -hmm. once they collect enough of those tokens, then it will, they can use it to redeem additional assets of the, of the creator. So the creator, mm -hmm. you can use token bonding curves in different ways. If you want to, look, if you want to increase the, the social reputation of the creator, then maybe part of the profits of any art that's being sold goes into this token bonding curve that will be governing the creators, um, creating its, minting its own tokens. So every time, it's, every time a, an asset changes hands, the owner and the past owner, they all have the, as the, the tokens of me as an as in creator. And then it also increases, it means additional tokens. Part of the money goes to that bonding curve. So the creator doesn't have to be putting money on its own, on their own into the system. It comes in from the ecosystem of every one of all the fans that's supporting it, supporting mm. the creator. So instead of just like mm. a, a patron for, for creator, <coughs> instead of just like a patron for creating for an, for a creator, you, it's, a, it's a bit more decentralized or it's a bit more open ecosystem where anyone that supports the creator gets to be inputting into supporting this creator. And the creator, if they, mm. if they want, can be redeeming tokens by buying back the, the art or whatever other ways that can be involved to be taking in part of the cash flow from that token bonding curve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's great. I love I love that. I think there's so many permutations here that could be experimented with. In the same way with the the Zora team and the Foundation team that is doing sort of using bonding curves for the sale of 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 like physical goods that's tied to a specific collector, whether it's prints or like tapes, like RAC did as a musician. Um, different ways to price these things while still having some of the funds go towards the artists in different ways. So yeah, that's a great idea. I think there's, there's, there's a lot of ways we can still try these things. Mm, I think so. So before we end, can I ask you, one, ask you one last question? If you have one advice you could give to token designers or ecosystem designers, what advice would you give? Um, I, I, I think, I think there's, there's the first piece of advice that I, there's two pieces of advice. The first one is that um, I think generally as token designers, crypto economic designers, um, we tend to sometimes overthink the ways, the overthink these systems and like much more of the work comes from design. Um, allowing a user to understand the economics right so if, if you make the economics complicated you're, you're going to create much more work to also explain this design towards the users um, so i think you can get very far by just sticking to simpler designs and focusing um, simpler economic designs and then focusing on like user experience design in order to make the user understand 
what's going on. And exp and just experimenting. That's why with the first art books always on sale, it was like just put it out there and and see and see what happens. Like it, there's no upgrade mechanism in there. It's just like just get it out there and see and see what happens. Um, and the second thing is that that when you do when you do want to get into sort of the nitty gritty of the actual crypto economic design, um, I th I think we and, and it does sort of tie to the first piece of advice is that um, you know it's a, it's like it's like we tend to try to design these systems such that we try to exclude as many malicious actors as possible like try to try to like avoid either colluding or cheating or civil attacks or or like ways in which someone can unscrupulously profit from something but but i but i think sometimes when we do that we make it more costly for honest users that just wants to participate to indeed participate um so i think there's a trade-off where you shouldn't necessarily try to make it so extreme that you're going to exclude like good normal users from using a specific economic design. So um, at some point in the crypto economic design, it's it's good enough. It's good enough such that you you can have users participate without it being too complicated. But you will you will or still could have some bad actors in there but it's tolerated like the cost of that is fine again it's like it's like the marginal utility curve it's it's somewhere in the middle it's like it's good it's it's good enough you know when we even see this and say automated market makers like many of them many of them still suffer from like front running right it's like people can front run all these tr tr transactions but it's good enough we tolerate the fact that there is these these malicious actors such that maybe in the future it could become intolerable that there's too many malicious or bad actors taking or scalping profits away. And then we upgrade to sort of batch bonding curves or whatever have you to, to solve these problems. So start simpler. Don't worry too much about too many malicious actors. Like these are problems that happen at scale and you first need to get to scale. So start simpler, focus on design, get people to use it and then iterate from there. It's not the end of the world if it's not the most perfect protocol from day one. Well, thank you very much. If is there anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess, like you know, the the more we experiment, the more we'll learn. So I guess that's still the, the important thing. You know, it's been it's been a few years in the space, but I still think we're we're early days, mm -hmm. and there's still a lot we can do, and still a lot we can invent. And you know, I implore people just to to publish what they're thinking and riff riff on each other. Yeah. There isn't a lot of people thinking about these aspects though. I feel like a lot of people are more involved in let's say DeFi, for instance. Really good. Mm. I think it's great what DeFi is doing. But a lot of people are incentivized for the quick the quicker returns than these kind of more complicated or complex considerations to be going on into this research to get to develop or design a better future in, for us mm. as people li moving on towards yeah. the digital world. And that's, that's quite yeah. a difficult thing to convince people, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Like DeFi for me, it's, it's like, it, it is not, it has not been my main focus why I care about blockchains or crypto economic design. For me, it's always been about like, how do we create more agency and empowerment for people? And specifically creators because I'm a creator myself. So like that that has always been like important considerations. It doesn't mean we can use DeFi to do that, but like most of what's happening in DeFi right now is not about like let's make sure that like like Lisa can have like can support herself with personal tokens or NFTs or whatever. Or it's 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 almost non-existent as is. Um, but hopefully, I mean the the possibility to to piggyback on DeFi to help creators. You know, that there's still this opportunities there. All right. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, pleasure. Goodbye. <laughs> Have a great day. <laughs> Thank you, Simon, for this episode. It has been a very interesting chat. If you're interested in more content like this, you can subscribe to our newsletter for 
the premium version or you can sign up to our Patreon to look at all the other videos and content available. Till then, I'll see you next week. Bye!